And do those slides come through? Yeah, they're perfect. Go ahead. All right. So I've got about 20 or 30 minutes of content to go through. Um, some of the slides are complicated, but I'll just try and focus on kind of the key points. I've made it so that it can appeal to kind of people of all ranges. So whether or not you've ever taken an immunology course or if you have, if it's been many years, I'll try and give you a quick crash course. Um, and I'm going to cover a few different topics, a little bit of vaccine history, uh, basics of immunology. And I've tried to rejig the presentation where some of the basic science, instead of presenting at the beginning where you have to hold kind of useless information in your head, it's gonna be integrated into kind of a myths and data section at the end to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, so why you should listen to some stranger on the internet. So I am one of the intensive care fellows at University Hospital and CCTC. Uh, I actually started out as um, Bachelor of Science at Queen's University in Life Sciences. And a lot of my courses are actually in microbiology and pharmacology. The nice intersection in between both is vaccination. So I've studied these kind of in three and 400 level classes. I then did Bent School in Limerick before doing my internal med residency in uh, Western. And I'm currently doing my ICU fellowship. That's me in my 3M Stormtrooper outfit. And then I am a little bit biased as I've already received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, but part of this presentation was going through uh, the data and whether or not I would, I would get it right away. Um, as mentioned before, we'll do a quick introduction. Um, some of the evidence behind the Pfizer biotech and the Moderna vaccines, and then some myths and misconceptions later on in the presentation. Uh, before I start, I really have no disclosures. I am a little bit biased towards the vaccine because like many of you, we work directly with COVID patients. Um, but otherwise, no one is paying me to give this talk in one slant or another. Uh, there may be some basic science along the way. And then as always, this presentation uh, focuses mostly on the vaccines, but it ignores the larger public health um, kind of overlay that we need to follow. So I defer to the latest public health direction and you can find them both the, at the Ontario and the federal level. This will not be on the test later. So essentially your immune system is a complicated net of various cells that have different functions. And you can really think of it as two different groups. So in the top half with this first chevron, you have this first contact. And this is a combination of innate immunity and some of the cellular mechanisms that you have to generate adaptive immunity. You do get very sick during this because your body is not used to whatever pathogen is trying to infect you. But what it does try and do is learn what it is so it can neutralize it if you come into contact with it again. And hopefully you survive the first encounter unscathed. Um, your second contact with your pathogen, ideally you have these friends, these B cells, and these helper T cells that kind of live throughout your body and they will try and target a repeat offender more quickly before it can infect your cells and prevent uh, kind of overwhelming infection and illness. The idea of vaccination is that you skip this first contact, this innate immunity and jump straight to your adaptive immunity, which will help protect you from becoming very sick. As a quick course on kind of how terrifying vaccination used to be. So 1792, this guy came around, Edward Jenner, Around his time, the best thing they had to offer is something called variolation, which is uh, this process of taking infectious material, so in this case, smallpox, which is normally an airborne virus with a case fatality rate of about 30%. Instead of, they would take the scabs um, as it created large pox marks over people's skin and then stick it into people's arms, which then created enormous blisters all the way up the arm. You, people generally didn't die, but they were definitely disfigured following this process. Um, in kind of an odd turn of events, he noticed that a lot of the milkmaids that worked on his estate were actually really good looking and had fair skin. Um, and he thought that this was because that cowpox, which is a similar um, virus that within animals could jump over to the milkmaids and gave them some adaptive immunity towards smallpox. So in an experiment that would not pass ethics these days, he took his gardener's son and purposely um, took the cowpox scabs and put it into the child's arm he had a very mild case of infection. And then a few weeks later, he went and took live smallpox uh, virus particles and then inoculated them into the child, which did not actually cause an overwhelming smallpox infection. And that's how vaccination was started. Uh, around the same time, probably rightly so, there were some, some commentators that thought this was maybe not the best idea and who knows what the effects of this new vaccination were. So Jones Gilroy, uh, made some very interesting flat pates of cows exploding out of various orifices of people. Thankfully, that was not one of the side effect profiles of vaccination at the time. 
And then I think as we all appreciate, vaccines have gotten significantly better through the 18th and 20th centuries. And there's multiple different uh, vaccines. We can have live attenuated viruses, which is um, an active virus that can replicate in your cells, but is too stunted to actually cause infection. We have killed vaccines, um, which are an entire particle, but completely neutralized, like polio. And we have subunit vaccines like hepatitis and the Tdap vaccine, where just small components that are non-infectious are used to train the immune system to prevent infections. Uh, more recently, we have virus-like particles, like the Gardasil vaccine, which are you know, Trojan horses with no infectious material, but look exactly like um, the live virus and can train the immune system without causing infection. And then kind of at the very end, we have this brand new COVID-19 nucleoside-based vaccine, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. I mean, do they work? Uh, arguably, yes. So these three kind of around the bottom and the top are all composed of the MMR vaccine. They are bacterial pathogens, but very effective after large-scale vaccination was rolled out. And the only um, RNA virus here is the polio virus up top, which also confers great immunity. Uh, DNA viruses are generally easier to vaccine against. They're more stable. They don't mutate as fast. Um, and as such, we are able to vaccine much better against them. Smallpox being the only uh, bug that we completely wiped out, although hopefully others will follow. We're close with a few other ones. RNA viruses are a little harder to vaccine against. Um, as we'll see after, RNA is very mutatable. It can change and mix in different vessels more uh, readily, so they're much more difficult to vaccine against. In terms of COVID-19 itself, there's an electron microscope uh, image on the left, so named because of this kind of corona crown of spike proteins you can see around the actual capsule of the virus. And then its genome is fairly basic. It's a positive single strength RNA virus. Uh, it does encode only a few proteins. Um, and most noticeably with the spike protein which is actually the target of vaccination, which corresponds to these big spiky bits on the outside of the, the virus. And we'll see a little bit more of this later on. And its life cycle is like many other viruses. It enters the body, it gets sucked into its cell. It then uncoats itself and then its uh, RNA material gets transcribed, if you will, into various proteins and then copied and then repackaged into a viral particle and then released to infect other cells or to infect other people. And then in humans, this is largely within the respiratory epithelium. So that was a very crash course of uh, immunology and a little bit about coronavirus. There'll be more slides after this, but I thought we should jump into some of the evidence behind the vaccines. There are two published papers with phase three trials right now. On the left side uh, is the Pfizer vaccine with the kind of the molecular mRNA code that they used. And on the right is the Moderna vaccine. If you actually want to read these, I found the Moderna vaccine was a little bit better written and easier to follow. Um, because Pfizer seems to be the one that we have in our large academic center, I've actually broken this one down to talk about. The Moderna was similar. I'll point out a couple differences at the end, and if I forget, someone can remind me after. Um, so in terms of the Pfizer uh, vaccine phase three trials, the primary endpoint that they chose to study the effectiveness of the vaccine was measured by symptomatic COVID-19 infections. So after you had the vaccine, they wanted to see evidence of symptoms. So usually kind of the two that you would enter on your screening checklist, runny nose, fever, cough, et cetera. Um, and then plus a positive PCR uh, test. They, only, they did record all infections, but for the actual efficacy of the vaccine, they chose seven days after your second dose of the vaccine to start counting that as an infection um, if you were in the vaccinated group. Moderna was a little bit different. Um, so Pfizer was days one and 21 were your vaccination time points. Moderna was day one and 28. Pfizer, they measured seven days after the second dose, whereas Moderna was 14 days after the second dose. So a little different. Uh, the methodology for this is was multinational, so multiple countries. It was placebo controlled and it was observer blinded. Um, the people giving the vaccine and the one, so the actual administrator and the people on site uh, or screening for side effects, did know which allocation people were in in case um, complications came up. But the, the patients and the people studying the vaccine were blinded. There's some fierce debate in the ethical world of uh, when they're going to unveil if someone was in the placebo or the uh, intervention group and whether or not they'll be used in a crossover study uh, to vaccinate them. The intervention was 30 micrograms of uh, the actual mRNA material versus saline 
a placebo injection. I apologize. This is days uh, one and 21. They had 43,000 people in a one-to-one -one, uh, split between the arms of placebo and intervention. All were greater than age 16. Of note, they did exclude uh, pregnant, immunocompromised, breastfeeding, and uh, children. And the total development time uh, for phase one, two, and three of this vaccine was 11 months. So in terms of the efficacy, this has kind of been pictorial form. Um, the top, top box is probably the most important. So these are people who definitely did not have infection at the start of the vaccination process with a negative PCR. And after the, the 70s, after the second vaccination, eight people within the intervention arm or who received the vaccine had a COVID-19 infection out of approximately 20,000 versus 162 in the placebo arm. Um, to, I have a hard time looking at uh, figures. I find graphs are much nicer. So in the, uh, the blue boxes, you have people that were in the placebo arm. The y-axis up here is your cumulative incidence of disease, so getting COVID-19, and the bottom is your days after dose one. So beginning at day zero, you can see that the arms are almost identical up until this bifurcation point, around 10 to 12 days. The group started to split. Um, placebo groups uh, continue to rise in terms of getting COVID-19, whereas the placebo group largely flattened out and only about eight people got it uh, going forward. Um, so to go back, they've said that the, the relative efficacy of the vaccine is 95%, and relative and absolute efficacy are uh, two different things. So relative, the numbers generally look a little bit better if there's small numbers that go into it. So if I told you that, you know, two people out of a thousand got a disease, whereas in my intervention arm only one out of a thousand got it, that would be a 50% relative reduction in infections, which sounds really great, but there's only one person that's different. And that one person would be something called the absolute rate. Um, if you broke it down in this study, one in 2,274 would be the absolute infection rate in the vaccination arm versus one in 113 in the placebo arm, uh, which is still fairly significant, but not the 95% uh, we talked about earlier. And then the NNT are the numbers needed to treat. So within the realm of this study, the number of people that need to be vaccinated to prevent one infection would be 119. Um, I do think this number is kind of artificially low. They've only followed people for uh, two months after the vaccination series. And I expect if we extend that out, since we know vaccination will likely last longer than that, that number will continue to shrink as the vaccine becomes more efficacious and uh, prevents infections going forward. In terms of their other secondary outpoint, uh, safety effects and side effects, the overall adverse event, so any severity at all, was 27% in the vaccine group and 12% in the placebo group. Um, overall, there were very mild infections, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, largely related to uh, local reactions around the vaccine site itself, with an average of two to three days of side effects. And then there were some system, systemic uh, side effects, including myalgias and fevers. Uh, deaths between the two groups, there was two in the vaccine group. One was arteriosclerosis related, the other one was a cardiac arrest. Neither were thought to be related to the vaccine, and four deaths in the placebo group two of unknown cause, one of stroke, and one of myocardial infarction. It's probably a good point to highlight something called the baseline rate. Whenever you have vaccinated an enormous group of people, so 40,000 in this case, and likely millions going forward with this vaccine, the weird and wonderful um, kind of diseases that people get will start to come up, and some of them will happen around the same time as vaccination. So if I got my vaccine on January the 6th and I got T-boned by a semi-trailer and died, I think it's pretty easy to say that that wasn't vaccine related. Whereas if I got my vaccine and suddenly developed ITP or some other odd immunologic disease, there'd be a lot of questions on whether or not that was vaccine related or not. And that's why we need these placebo groups to see what the baseline rate of a disease in a population is to really see if a vaccine can cause some of these side effects or not. And arguably within these two months that people were checked, there was um, no significant difference in death between the groups. Um, thankfully, no one in either group died of uh, COVID while they were being uh, vaccinated or shortly thereafter. In terms of putting this into a table form, um, they've described uh, adverse events as any event. So 20, almost 27% in the, in the um, intervention arm. 
related to the vaccine. So afterwards, a panel looked at people's uh, reactions, how close it was to the vaccine, decide if it was related to the vaccine or not. They had also had severe uh, categories and severe they described as anything that would prevent you from working that day or the day after your vaccination um, or whether or not you'd be able to go to school. So the bar was actually low. Severe did not mean going to the hospital. And then life-threatening was uh, requiring medical attention in the emergency department and very low at 0.1%. And again, deaths were very low down at the bottom, two versus four. Uh, the Moderna, this is the biggest difference I found between the Moderna study and the Pfizer study was the side effect profile. Pfizer was only about 27%, probably related to that small uh, bolus of mRNA, only about 30 micrograms. Moderna had about 100 micrograms and their side of profile was much higher, around 85%. Thankfully, again, most of them were mild, but likely because of the higher mRNA uh, load and kind of uh, the mule kick of immunogenicity, they had a higher side effect profile. Again, mild, but still notable that you're more likely to get side effects with that vaccine. In terms of uh, study limitations here, the huge one is asymptomatic carriage because they only checked for uh, clinically significant infections. We don't know if people had asymptomatic infection with COVID-19 and whether or not they were infectious to other people, which is a big limitation. I think they are looking into this and see if um, there is complete elimination of COVID-19 and transmission, but we can't say for sure right now. Um, for that reason, even after you're vaccinated, people will still uh, be required to follow public health criteria, masks, socially distance until either the majority of the population is uh, vaccinated or we know for sure that asymptomatic carriers is gone. We don't know if there's single dose efficacy. There was a divergence in groups uh, the 12 days after the first dose. We don't know for sure truly how effective it is. So it's still a, a two course vaccination. Long-term immunity is still up in the air. This study only captured two months of data after the vaccin vaccination um, period. They will be looking forward on this, uh, either as a continuation of the exam or a crossover. If people in the placebo group are notified and choose to be vaccinated, we will find out. And we don't know efficacy and safety in subgroup populations, such as children, pregnancy, breastfeeding, immunocompromised. Uh, currently, as Dr. Easterbrook will probably counsel us about after pregnancy and breastfeeding, uh, women are not withheld from the vaccine. Likewise, immunocompromised people are available to have the vaccine. And then within the study itself, a large group was predominantly white, 83%, and a lot of them were not elderly, so under the age of 85. Um, I've tried to integrate a lot of these slides going forward into myths and concerns to try and make it a little bit more interactive. Uh, and these kind of a snapshot of what we'll talk about. So in a rapid fire sense, uh, the ingredients are harmful for the vaccine. And arguably there's a lot less ingredients in uh, this than other vaccines that we have available. The genetic material component of the meat of this vaccine is the mRNA. And we'll point out, point out in this upcoming slide how it works. Um, there's a series of lipids that forms the nano uh, lipid particle. So PEG, our favorite polyethylene glycol, the very same. And then a few other kind of chemical codes on it. Um, they sound scary, but they're really not. They have really long names so that someone can read the actual chemical structure and be able to draw out exactly where uh, each of the molecules forms. Um, so while they are kind of big names, they're just glorified fats to form this lipid nanoparticle to gain access to the cell by dissolving into it. There's a little bit of sugar, and then there's some uh, buffered phosphate solution, so it matches human plasma quite well. And then instead of having preservatives or whatnot to kind of hold the nanoparticle together, they used extreme cold to hold it in stasis until it could be injected. Um, in terms of the, actually the next slide is better. There we go. So this is kind of, can you get COVID from the vaccine? And the answer is no. So to get a, a symptomatic COVID infection that can spread to others, you need the entire SARS-CoV-2 um, a particle, so that includes the lipid envelope, it includes the envelope protein, the spike protein, which is this big uh, green one here, along with this uh, long mRNA sequence that encodes all of these proteins. The actual RNA vaccine looks a little bit like this. So you have this orange on the outside, which is the lipo nanoparticle that will dissolve into human cells because it's the same thing that we're made of, which is just glorified fat envelopes that hold our cells together. And then within it is the mRNA vaccine that only encodes this spike protein. 
uh, which is this green uh, section here. So it's impossible to generate cars or SARS from the mRNA vaccine. You may feel sick with uh, flu-like illness, and that's just your immune system ramping up to generate immunity against the spike protein, but it's not actually a COVID infection itself. Uh, so the vaccine development was rushed. I will say it was accelerated in 11 months um, between conception to phase three studies. They were able to do this because they used um, simultaneous phase one, two, three studies, in addition to a, a lot of push to get this on the market because the consequence um, of delaying would be a, a lot of dead people from COVID. It was actually longer developed than other vaccines. So pandemic H1N1 back in um, 2009 was pushed out a lot faster in short months. Though arguably you can say they were just using old vaccine platforms at an accelerated sense. And likewise, the high population incidence of uh, COVID made for a great testing ground for uh, phase one, two, and three studies, because it became very clear if uh, people in the placebo group would continue to get infections versus the vaccine group, as we saw in the earlier slides. The vaccine life cycle, much like the rest of the FDA life cycle for drugs, was the exact same for every other drug on development. The basic research discovery and preclinical studies were actually done well in advance of uh, COVID ever being identified. And then from there, phase one, two, and three were done in rapid succession, but were done kind of to the satisfaction of the FDA review board. A quick review, the phase one study is a very small group of people, tens, maybe a hundred. They get a whopping dose of the mRNA to see what the side effect profile is. Is there any life-threatening harm to it? If not, then they advance to phase two, which is effectiveness. They start to hone down uh, what dose and what um, vaccine course you need. And then they use a much larger group of people, so kind of the hundreds to maybe low 1,000s. And then in Pfizer, they've decided on that day one in 21 with 30 micrograms of mRNA. And then they move into that phase three study. And that's the one that we examined in the NGM article of 40,000 people. From there, everything is reviewed to the FDA to look at and then to the um, ACIP, which they have adversary committee on immunization practices before being rolled out to phase four, which is where we are now, where you and I can get the vaccine. Um, CDC and FDA will continue to monitor for side effects in both a kind of police group and the people who get uh, the COVID-19 vaccination. mRNA vaccines have been around for a little while. In 92, actually, they started to study whether or not you could uh, generate proteins from mRNA. And they did it by injecting a little bit of vasopressin mRNA into a rat brain, and then they got an expected physiologic response. So free water was, was retained from the kidneys. And then from the 90s to 2010, a lot of uh, groups were trying to figure out how to make mRNA more stable as it normally degrades in the body quite quickly to make sure that it can, one, be delivered into the cell, survive long enough, and then generate an intact immune response. And I found a review from kind of 2017, 2018 that was going through a lot of the, the vaccine studies that were being done. They were a very small, phase one, phase two, tens to hundreds of people. Um, are still being studied, nothing nearly to the you know, the scope of the COVID-19 vaccination studies, but still interesting that they're going on and no significant side effects other than what we kind of pointed out earlier were found. And then 2010 was kind of a, a springboard to get these drugs on the market. Um, can COVID-19 be contracted from the mRNA vaccine? I think I answered this before and jump back. Um, you cannot get it from the vaccine. Uh, can the mRNA vaccine alter my DNA? And the answer is a definitive no. I'll do a little bit better in the next slide, but there's no cellular mechanism to reverse transcribe mRNA into DNA. Um, there are two viruses, so human T lymphocyte viruses and HIV, they can go backwards, but it's through a very specific vaccine, um, or sorry, a very specific mRNA sequence with a lot of proteins that the virus brings itself that aren't present in uh, either the vaccine or uh, COVID-19. Um, sorry for the basic science. On the left-hand side, you have your DNA and your RNA. Your DNA is very much like your grandma's scone recipe. It's on really thick cardstock. I don't know what ink she used for it, but it's impervious to whatever grease smears you get in the kitchen. There's only one copy of it, and it's usually locked up in a nice little box, um, kind of like DNA very stable over time, it's repaired, it is held within the nucleus, which is kind of like the iron chamber to make sure that nothing alters it. 
from there, if you want to make scones, it's great. Um, the problem is you only have one copy, but your whole family wants to have uh, their own copy of it. So many photocopies probably on really bad paper get made. Um, it's a little bit degraded over time and it doesn't last very long before it goes into the recycling bin and you get a, a copy of the recipe. It's kind of like your RNA. It's a widespread distribution mechanism for your cell to be able to create a tremendous amount of proteins from various copies of mRNA. And then it degrades rapidly and it goes away, kind of like your photocopies. And then finally, it's uh, transcribed by the ribosome into uh, this polypeptide uh, chain, which is then folding into a functional protein, kind of like getting your scones. There's no way to go backwards up this chain. Um, so the RNA will not be turned into to DNA or interact. Uh, the mRNA that goes into the cell will be transcribed and then degrade. More likely, though, is the cell that um, takes up the mRNA will be targeted for cell destruction through the mechanisms we talked about earlier with uh, T lymphocytes and natural killer cells. And then the protein being the spike protein that we talked about that generates the immunity. Um, the side effect of the vaccines are not worth the risk. And I would argue uh, the risk benefit is on the side of the vaccine. Um, a couple of things I thought about is COVID is not a binary disease. You don't get it and die or don't get it and survive. There's this huge middle ground between uh, recovered and dead that does have its own uh, not so good uh, morbidity. The side effect profile is actually in line with a lot of other vaccines, particularly the Pfizer vaccine. MMR has a greater than 20% a side effect profile, including the mild side effects that we saw. The Moderna does have a bit more of a side effect profile, but they are mild, um, two to three days, generally self-limiting with some Tylenol. There is the nocebo effect, so even people with the saline a placebo did have side effects to it. Um, so I think it's the side effect profile is quite uh, mild. And as we talked about earlier, the baseline rates are important for some of the more serious complications. Uh, the natural history, I think a lot of us know after seeing them in the unit. Um, a lot of people have this very mild COVID, maybe a stuffy nose, a little bit of mild pneumonia that never requires oxygen. But 10 to 12% get this severe infection that lands them in the hospital with hypoxia or the ICU. And you have this small subgroup, 1% to 3% that will succumb to their illness. The case fatality rate is probably a little bit low because we, we miss a lot of symptomatic infections, but it's nonetheless a lot of... Uh, dead people would you account for how many people actually get the infection and then likewise for the natural uh, history on the right hand side you can see um, the ground glass that appears in this person's lung i think it's three days after symptom onset and then likewise expanding five days after onset 14 before recovering around 21 days uh, this person did require hospitalization and auction and but was feeling well upon discharge um, Likely from a pulmonary standpoint, you won't have too many complications. On the left is a rapidly progressing a fibrosis of the lungs. You can see them here with these little uh, black areas. This is a permanent scarring of the lungs, which will, will not resolve. Um, likewise, there's some uh, PHO kind of concern about long-term sequelae of COVID-19. Looking back at SARS-CoV-1, there was a lot of people who had a uh, really DLCO in their lung, so kind of severe long-term uh, changes in addition to other things like uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, which actually had a 20 to 30% um, a group, even if you were recovered. Whether or not COVID-19 has as high rates as these, we're not sure yet. Only time will tell, but I, I think it'll be more than we think it'll be. Um, I've already had COVID-19. I don't need the vaccine. CDC recommendation is yes, you should still be vaccinated even if you get COVID-19. Um, it's unclear if naturally obtained COVID-19 generates an adequate response and to generate long-term immunity. It looks like you're well protected for 90 days, but unclear after that. Uh, likewise, people that get vaccinated don't seem to have any more severe side effect than those who do not. So you should likely be vaccinated even if you don't have even if you have had COVID-19. Um, am I pregnant? Can we be vaccinated? I will defer this question since we have an expert on the line in the next couple of minutes. Um, I've been vaccinated, hooray. Do I need, still need to follow public health recommendations? And yes, you do for the same reason that we don't know if this vaccine protects against um, asymptomatic carriage and spread to other people. I suspect it does, but time will tell. So continue to follow public health guidelines until information is released.
And then finally, um, the 5G discussion, Bill Gates microchipping you, even though you have a phone in your pocket that does that anyways. I don't think I could particularly help you if you've uh, made it through this far in the presentation and are still skeptical. And then in terms of the future, um, there's a very interesting one that's coming out. Phase three for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is coming out. A little bit different, it's a self-amplifying mRNA. So whereas the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine just have one kind of dollop of mRNA that gets transcribed into proteins, the Johnson Johnson has a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that will regenerate its own mRNA within a cell and generate a very robust immunity after only one dose. Um, I haven't reviewed the phase three, it's not out yet, but later this month, it'll be neat because it is one shot. And that kind of concludes what I had prepared uh, for today. Thank you for listening. Um, I think I will hand it over to Dr. Easterbrook unless there are other uh, questions. I think Thanks overall it's, you. oh, no worries. Yeah, it's a risk benefit. I've decided to get the vaccine. Um, and I, I would be, I think I would encourage other people to get it as well. So thank you for listening. I well, appreciate that. Yeah, if you can stop your screen share and then we'll switch over to Dr. Easterbrook. Um, thank you for that presentation. We'll probably hold questions till the end uh, just so we can get both and we can get Dr. Easterbrook through. Um, I liked your skull and example. I've heard the idea of trying to make DNA out of the mRNA vaccine is like making a tree out of baseball bats. So it's quite challenging. Um, but as we switch gears, I just want to extend another uh, thanks to Dr. Easterbrook. She uh, is graciously donating her time. Uh, across divisions or departments here, uh, and I think this is in response to a lot of concern or question within folks within our unit who are considering families, uh, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. So thank you very much, Dr. Easterbrooks, and uh, take it away. Hi, thanks for inviting me to, to speak to all of you this afternoon. Um, I'm always pleased to be involved in uh, sort of cross-disciplinary um, adventures like this. I call it an adventure because um, it's often an adventure when I end up down in CCTC at, uh, at Victoria Hospital. Um, I don't have as much experience obviously with the, um, with the folks that um, work up at UH because we try not to do any gynecology or obstetrics up there unless we absolutely have to. So, um, so there's a lot of unfamiliar um, uh, people on the, on the line. Um, so I was asked to give a little bit of information about the status of COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy and, and lactation. And this is a topic that I have been a very um, passionate champion for um, since the vaccination started to roll out because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and, you know, the other, the other thing that really comes into play is that you know, if you look at um, healthcare workers, particularly those in the front line, about 85% are female. So when you put it into that context, thinking that, um, you know, the majority of our nurses, um, many of our PSWs um, are, are women and not only women, but women of reproductive age, um, there is an enormous impact on um, COVID uh, disease and also um, COVID vaccination um, in terms of this population. And obviously, in uh, dealing with um, women who are planning pregnancies, um, women who are pregnant, um, they really only want the very best and safest thing um, for them and their their fetus and their family. Um, and so, you know, this this does um, bring up a lot of questions um, and a lot of anxiety about the safety of new therapeutics, um, the safety of vaccinations in general, but also the safety um, and the the risks with contracting a disease that's only been around for a year. Um, and so, we therefore don't have any long term um, outcome data um, for. Uh, for COVID-19 um, in terms of in terms of what you know what the children of COVID are going to look like in, in the future. So I am a maternal fetal medicine subspecialist. So um, I am an OBGYN um, who's done extra training um, in high risk uh, pregnancy and fetal diagnosis. Um, Sorry, I just got to advance my slide. Okay, um, I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, I will tell you that I am a site co-investigator for a planned phase three trial of um, an RSV vaccine that's specifically targeted to healthy pregnant women in order to generate antibodies that cross the placenta in order to prevent RSV, um, which is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality um, in infants. Now, interestingly, we haven't seen essentially any RSV this year. Um, just like influenza, it's, it seems to be a disease that has disappeared um, with all of the um, hygiene measures that people have been taking. 
So um, in terms of COVID-19 and pregnancy, um, because most pregnant women are young and healthy, um, the majority are um, similar to those that contract it um, in young adulthood um, in that they have mild to moderate symptoms. There seems to be a fair amount of asymptomatic spread um, amongst this population um, when looking at some data from large um, you know, birthing centers where there have been outbreaks, um, such as in New York, for instance, um, it does seem that um, asymptomatic carriage of, of COVID has been a major risk factor actually for transmission to healthcare providers in, in pregnant women. We do know, however, that there's an increased risk of hospitalization, morbidity, and mortality in pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women um, with similar demographics. Um, so looking at um, sort of the big registry data um, for all COVID cases um, in Canada um, and also combining those with um, other uh, countries where there have been large numbers, um, there is approximately 8 to 11 percent of pregnant women that will um, require hospitalization for COVID in pregnancy. Um, and about um, 2 to 4 percent will require admission to um, the intensive care unit um, Pregnancy is an independent risk factor for requiring mechanical ventilation with COVID um, as well. The other thing to point out though is that the risk of severe morbidity in pregnancy is associated with other medical risk factors which are similar to those types of comorbidities that are, um, that are associated with severe disease in the non-pregnant population, um, which include advancing age, asthma, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, et cetera. The other key thing that I, I mentioned previously is that we don't have any long-term outcomes of COVID-19 infection in pregnancy or the sequelae on, um, on fetuses and children because this is such a new infection. It does not seem to be a teratogenic virus. There doesn't seem to be any signal for um, birth defects related um, to COVID infection. And there's a lot of dispute as to whether or not vertical transmission is a significant risk. Um, there's been some placental studies that have, that have demonstrated perhaps virus um, in the syncytium of the placenta. However, um, we don't know whether that, that actually can be concluded that the infection is passing on to the fetus or whether it's, it's blocked in the syncytium of the placenta the way it's supposed to because it really acts as a barrier. There is a significantly increased risk of iatrogenic preterm births in women with COVID in pregnancy. And um, a lot of the reason for that is that um, when women are critically ill and they're facing things like um, mechanical ventilation, um, even ECMO, um, you know, particularly if the fetus is viable, um, it may be um, more appropriate to, um, to deliver the, the, the baby rather than um, maintain the pregnancy. Um, because as you, I'm sure no, um, pregnancy um, can make it challenging to, um, uh, to ventilate pregnant women. Um, it can make it challenging if, if they have circulatory collapse. And so sometimes evacuating the uterus can actually be life-saving. Um, the other thing though, is that there may be a um, increased risk of um, spontaneous preterm birth um, in patients with COVID. And some thoughts around that are just from the, um, the very dramatic um, SIRS-like um, inflammatory reaction that you get, um, the cytokine storm, and there may be a possible effect of the virus itself on the placenta, um, particularly in the mid trimester, with um, with a withdrawal of progesterone receptors. So, because there are ACE and, uh, um, ACE and, uh, receptors in the placenta, um, there's there's a thought that that might might contribute. I think one of the big things that's forgotten, though, is the psychosocial implications of women with COVID um, illness in pregnancy in terms of being isolated. So you are, if you have mild disease, you can't leave your house for 14 days. Um, if you have severe disease and you deliver um, before you have recovered, um, you may not be allowed to enter the NICU to see your baby. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the news report of um, a woman in Vancouver who um, was uh, in the intensive care um, in the, the um, greater Vancouver area, um, had her baby by cesarean section and um, didn't actually meet her baby for almost two months. So there's certainly going to be some long-term Im Im implications of that as well. So similarly, I came up with a common myths and misconceptions about COVID vaccination in women of reproductive age. 
Um, one of the big ones I've seen going around is that it might cause infertility because antibodies against the spike protein um, may attack a protein important in implantation. And when you actually look at the um, the value of the data on this, it's it's essentially nil. Um, there's um, some similarly similarities in amino acid structure between the spike protein and a protein called um, syncytiatin, um, but uh, there's not enough crossover that this would be remotely biologically plausible. The second is that it wasn't tested on pregnant or lactating women because it's unsafe. And then the um, converse is that it's unsafe to administer because it wasn't tested on them. Um, it doesn't work during pregnancy because pregnant women are immune suppressed. It can cross the placenta and infect the baby or change its DNA. And I think, um, I think that that was covered very well um, in the previous presentation. Um, and that it can cross into the breast milk and infect the baby. And again, um, because it doesn't contain any live or even attenuated virus, um, that, uh, that also is not biologically plausible. So in general, um, pregnant women are offered vaccinations routinely for many other infections. Um, the, the two most commonly used vaccinations in pregnancy are those for influenza on a seasonal basis. Um, and we actually recommended that recommend that all pregnant women receive influenza vaccination because influenza um, certainly has a much greater impact in terms of morbidity and mortality in pregnancy um, than in many other populations. Um, particularly the H1N1 strain is a very scary one in pregnancy. Um, the Tdap vaccination um, is something that's been rolled out recently. We are offering all pregnant women between about 26 and 32 weeks um, a Tdap booster, specifically for the pertussis um, contained in that um, vaccination. And the reason for that is um, so that transplacental passage of antibodies um, will protect the newborn um, prior to the vaccine series being, being given, because unfortunately we have seen a resurgence of, of pertussis disease. But we also um, give um, vaccinations in pregnancy um, as post-exposure prophylaxis. So for instance, um, for hepatitis A and B, um, or even for rabies. Um, and so there are many situations where, um, you know, if women are traveling to uh, places where there's epidemic or pandemic illness, um, we may take a look um, at the vaccination recommendations and recommend vaccines that aren't routinely offered, but are certainly safe. There are actually very few vaccinations that are contraindicated in pregnancy because they're live or live attenuated. So there's a theoretical risk of, um, of uh, either contracting the, the disease or um, potentially transplacental passage of the virus um, or the bacteria. Um, the MMR um, is a, a live attenuated vaccination. Um, it is safe in breastfeeding though, so we boost mums postpartum um, because um, specifically congenital rubella is such a terrible, um, a terrible disease. Um, if we give a mom, uh, give a woman MMR and she subsequently is found out to be pregnant, um, it is not an indication for um, termination of pregnancy because um, congenital rubella syndrome from, uh, from a vaccination has actually never been reported. Um, varicella and yellow fever are the other vaccinations that are not, um, that are not um, routinely offered in pregnancy and uh, the other one uh, is HPV. So we've had a nice crash course about the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and unfortunately, pregnant and breastfeeding women, as usual, were excluded from the phase two and phase three studies. Um, this is a recurring problem um, in all uh, vaccination studies and in most medication studies. And in fact, if you look at any medication that's um, used in pregnancy, um, none of these medications are ever studied in pregnancy, with the um, exception of um, diclectin, which is uh, the anti-nausea medication, um, is the only medication that's actually licensed for use in pregnancy. So really, all of the data that we have for medications and vaccines are based on um, registries of people who were inadvertently exposed to these medications um, and uh, and eventually we get an accumulated um, amount of data um, that shows us that um, that there's no significant um, uh, worrisome signals for for lack of safety of note there were 23 women in the Pfizer um, vaccine study and I haven't looked at the moderna um, data to see if there were exposed pregnant women in it. But in the Pfizer um, study, there was 12 in the vaccine arm and 11 in the placebo arm who reported pregnancies during the trial. And they are being followed um, closely, but with no reports of adverse effects. 
Of note, there was one early pregnancy loss in total um, in amongst the 23 women, and this was actually in a patient who received the placebo. So this brings us to the guidance. Um, there was a flurry of activity um, in the, the media and across organizations um, because there was a lack of consistency between countries um, and even between provinces in terms of the guidance around COVID vaccination in pregnancy. Um, initially, the um, SOGC, which is the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Canada, so it's basically our, our, um, our licensing and um, academic body across the country for, for um, obstetrics and gynecology, stated that um, women in high-risk groups should receive it. It took a long time for the Ontario Ministry of Health to come around um, to changing their decision making, um, and uh, we've been actively had been actually uh, actively fighting with the um, vaccination clinic um, to uh, get um, pregnant and lactating women um, vaccinated, um, you know, even if they had special permission from their physician. So um, the consensus statement from SOGC, um, you can see here um, that they recommend that they should be offered vaccination if they're eligible and no contraindications exist. And really the decision should be based on the woman's personal values, under understanding that the risk of infection or morbidity outweighs the theorized undescribed risk of being vaccinated. And women should not be um, withheld vaccination based on pregnancy status or breastfeeding. And this is now in line with the American College of ONG, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, and the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the UK. So I, I like a pathway towards um, informed, but also shared decision making between um, healthcare providers um, and, and patients. And the particular um, tenet that needs to be um, with, upheld is, is patient autonomy. The discussion should include but not be limited to the following. So um, what the local epidemiology and risk of community acquisition is, the workplace situation and the risk of work-related acquisition, which obviously working in an intensive care setting, in a medical unit setting, in a long-term care um, is, is extremely high. Um, and then the individual risk profile, um, and this includes um, comorbidities um, such as um, uh, pre-existing diabetes, um, hypertension, obesity, asthma, um, but also some other higher risk populations, so potentially um, Indigenous people um, and other racialized people as well. Um, the gestational age um, at the, the time of the pregnancy, um, some people are still very reluctant to receive any sort of treatment um, in the first trimester of pregnancy, um, and then the available data related to the safety um, as well as um, uh, for breastfeeding, and then individual beliefs. So what can patients expect after they're vaccinated? Um, well, again, from, from the, the um, Pfizer and the Moderna, um, we know that there um, are expected side effects. And I think that if you counsel patients that it's actually normal to have some immune response to your vaccination, um, you, you tend to get a lot less um, concerns about it. Um, so, you know, people will get pain, fatigue, and headache. Um, and about 16% of the younger non-pregnant patients did develop a fever. And I think the key thing is that is to encourage um, pregnant patients in particular that if they develop a fever that they can take an antipyretic such as um, Tylenol, but not NSAIDs, um, in order to reduce their fever um, for, for comfort. Um, because we do know that having a fever in pregnancy, particularly a high and prolonged one, can have some adverse effects. Um, and uh, encourage them to know that there is active surveillance going on for the COVID vaccine. There are registries available. There's a CAN COVID database um, and Born Ontario is also collecting the data. What about people planning pregnancy? Well, again, if you um, discover a, a pregnancy during your vaccine series or shortly afterwards, you should not be counseling patients to terminate their pregnancy. There is um, no sort of biological mechanism by which the vaccine would be teratogenic. Um, and certainly if they've already begun their course, um, you know, we would recommend unless other circumstances um, arose that uh, that we recommend that they get their second second vaccine. And similarly, you know, if you're planning a pregnancy, you know, in the near future, it'd be best to get your vaccination completed um, in preparation for pregnancy, but there's no guidance on how long to um, wait before getting pregnant. And again, it probably isn't a, isn't a major concern. Um, and then the big question is, you know, should you delay pregnancy? 
in order to receive the vaccination if you're on a waiting list. And that has to be an individual decision based on, I think, the level of risk of contracting the illness. So in summary, um, COVID vaccination is recommended for pregnant and lactating people who are working in high risk settings and or who have high risk medical conditions posing increased risk of severe COVID-19 complications. The lack of data in these populations is an unfortunate consequence of the restrictive research study protocols that have systematically excluded pregnant and lactating people from this and other um, studies. And an informed discussion with antenatal care providers is helpful in making a decision about vaccination. And please stay off the internet conspiracy websites. <laughs>